go. Adjunctions. So far, we've seen two definitions of a junction. We've seen the one like this one, and we've seen the one like uh, the other one, which had the natural isomorphism between some home sets. But I, I want to think about this one a little bit more. I promised that I was going to prove why those two definitions were the same. And I'm going to carry on promising that. But before we prove that those two things are the same, I want to talk a little bit about how it's related to monads, because it's just so much fun. I can't resist it anymore. Um, so this definition says we've got a pair of functors and we've got a pair of natural transformations like this, be called the unit and the co-unit, satisfying the triangle identity. Now, the other thing I haven't said is what any examples of adjunctions are. Um, and some very nice examples come from some things we've been talking about a little bit already. For example, so here's an example. If you have um, the category of sets, I'm going to try really hard to get this the right way around. The category of sets over here and the category of monoids over here, we know how to start with a set and make a free monoid on it. Free. And we know how to start with a monoid and forget that it was a monoid and just take its underlying set. Forget. And it turns out that this is part of an adjunction. And there are other ones we can do as well. We had, we talked about graphs and the category of small categories. And we've got the free category functor and the forgetful category functor. And that turns out to be part of an adjunction as well. And one of the things to remember is that free functors are left adjoint to forgetful functors. This is nice for various reasons, and one is that quite often when we're doing free constructions, we want to say what it means really to be free. Sometimes we sort of know emotionally in our heart that it's free, because we've just done things really freely, but that's not a very precise mathematical thing to say. Whereas here we can say that if it's left adjoint to a forgetful functor, that is a, a completely definable notion of free. You might be wondering how you remember which is left and which is right. And it's very easy to remember which is left and which is right, because Left has four letters, and so does free, and so that means that free is a left adjoint. Okay, maybe don't tell anyone I said that. Um, moving swiftly on, why were we talking about the free monoid construction before? We were talking about it because it gave rise to a monad for us, and there's there's um, no prizes for guessing what I'm going to say next. No, there is a prize for guessing guessing what I'm going to say next, which is that you can feel like you're getting the hang of this stuff. What I'm going to say next is that every adjunction gives rise to a monad in a completely wonderful canonical way. So here it is. Um, every adjunction gives rise to a monad. Now, what do we have to do to define a monad? We have to give a functor, we have to give an underlying category, a functor from that category to itself, and, yes, a pair of natural transformations, eta and mu. Hmm, that's funny. We've got a pair of natural transformations, and what's even funnier is that one of them is called eta. Could it possibly be because it's the same eta? Right. So what's the monad? It gives rise to a monad. So every adjunction like this, uh, as above, as above, so that's f left adjoint to g like this, gives rise to a monad, the underlying category is c, on c, y. So what's the functor going to be? Well, look, we've got a category c, and I'm saying that we want to give a functor from c to c. What possible functor from c to c is there? Well, there's the one that says do f and then do g, which, by the way, I write as gf. So that's a wonderful functor from c to itself. Now, let's call that T, because that's what we were always calling our monads before. What do we need? We need, uh, we need a unit that goes from the identity on C to T. Well, fancy that. T equals GF, and we've already got a unit that goes from the identity on C to T. So the unit is going to be eta, as before, from 1 to T, which is, of course, GF. 
Now, what about the multiplication? What does the multiplication have to do? It has to go from t squared to t. What's t squared? t squared is g f g f. What's t? t is g f. So what we have to do here, well, we can remove this f g from the middle. And we've got a way of removing f g because that's what epsilon is. So we're going to remove this f g from the middle using g epsilon f. So mu equals the natural transformation g epsilon f. And it goes from the right place to the right place, and that goes from t squared to t. And to finish off checking that this really is an honest-to-God monad, what we have to do is check for two axioms. So now let's check for two axioms, she says nervously, hoping that she can check for two axioms on the spur of the moment. Um, let's see what the first one is. So... Maybe that was an unhelpful thing for me to work out. Sorry. Take a picture of the, 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 the computer screen or something. Um, so the axioms for a monad, they are the triangular ones, one of which says that if you do t to t squared by t eta, and then you come down via mu to t, you should get the identity. So what does that say in our case? What it says is, okay, t is gf. T squared is G F G F and eta is eta. So what we've got here is G F eta and mu is G epsilon F. Okay, let's stare at that really hard for a second and think, well, I never. It comes from one of the triangle identities. Because if you just hallucinate those G's away, put your G filter glasses on, you'll see that actually this diagram is just G of a triangle identity. Okay, done. Guess what? There's the other one as well. Oh, now I've got a complete blackboard disaster. Where am I going to put this? Should to I just wipe this out? Should I put it on the top? Okay, the other axiom, the, the right-hand side one, says that if you put eta on the left and you do mu, you should also get the identity. Okay, now let's write this out. G, F. G, F, G, F. I can feel my time ticking away. It's terrible. Uh, G, F. Am I going to do it in time? Am I? Am I? Uh, what's this? So this is eta, G, F. And no prizes for guessing. Yes, it's the other uh, triangle identity. Because if we remove the Fs from the right-hand side here, no, we've done something terribly wrong. No, we haven't. It's right. It's right. Remove the Fs from the right-hand side. So this is the other triangle identity with... F on the right. Phew. Okay, now I've got one and a half minutes to do the multiplicative, the associative square. Finally, we've got T cubed goes to T squared goes to T goes to T squared goes to T. This is mu T. This is T mu. This is mu. This is mu. So we've got G F G F G F G F G F. G, F, G, F, G, F. Okay, what's up here? We've got G, E to F, because that's mu, and then we've got a, an extra G of F on the end. Here we've got an extra G F on the left, and we've got G, E to F. Here we've got G, E to F, and here we've got G, E to F, and I've got one minute to work out why that commutes. Oh, uh, well, it obviously commutes. I mean, it obviously commutes, right? We need some help from the audience. Why did this obviously commute? Well, look, what we've got is an eta living over here and an eta living on the other side. And I think this is just saying that if you do eta and then eta, it's a naturality square. It's a naturality for eta. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. It's a naturality for eta. Naturality for eta. Uh, because look, because look, look. Why is it naturality for eta? Because this is, it's G. It's G of naturality for eta. Because if you remove these two Gs, you've got eta at... Epsilon. 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 It's naturally for epsilon. Uh, epsilon at G, uh, F, G, F. And this is epsilon at F. And these are morphisms, right? So this is G, this is F, G on the morphism. And this is the other one on the morphism. Stop, stop. It's done. 